Well, good morning, Calvary. Hey, grab your Bibles. Turn with me to Matthew chapter one today. Matthew chapter one. Um, I sure do hope that you were able to have been with us last Sunday when my brother Tim Gilligan was here. Did you enjoy that last week? And yeah, such a fun Sunday, powerful word. If you were not here or didn't get a chance to, to watch online, I'd encourage you to go out to our website or our YouTube channel and uh, check out a sermon that I really think has the, uh, uh, the opportunity to really change some of the ways that we view and think about our lives in so many ways. Well, we are working through the Gospel of Matthew, and the reason is that we want to take some time deliberately as a church and focus on the life of Jesus what he did, how he lived, what he taught, his miracles, how all of that impacts us. And uh, so whether you're watching online, you're here in the room, maybe you're in auditorium too, thanks for joining us. Maybe you're listening to the podcast or watching on television. We're so glad that you are here today. We, We started the book of Matthew by looking at Jesus' family tree kind of his lineage, his descendants, and we took several weeks to kind of look at why so many of these Old Testament people so clearly play an important role in the life of Jesus. And even though this whole series as we move through Matthew is about focusing on the life of Jesus, for at least the first two chapters of the Gospel of Matthew, it's a lot of other people that the the book focuses on. And so what we're gonna do for the next few weeks is look at a story that we usually only look at in December, The end of Matthew chapter one, Matthew chapter two are the Christmas stories that we consider so many times at the end of the year, but in this month, July, we're gonna do Christmas in July and spend the next three weeks looking at this. That's why I even wore my Christmas shirt today. (laughs) And can I tell you, for the record, it's too warm to wear in July. (laughs) I wish I wasn't wearing it. And so what we're gonna do for these next few weeks is usually at Christmas, Our focus goes so much to the nativity in a very right and appropriate way that sometimes I don't know that we take a good look at the characters that are really involved in the story and the the details behind some of their lives. So we're gonna look a little bit maybe behind the scenes at, at some of the individuals that we might not always focus on in the same way these next few weeks as we talk about Christmas in July. And one of the best parts about Christmas is surprises, isn't it? Anybody like surprises? I've told the story, I don't know how many times over the years, about the Christmas morning that I got up and was surprised to get the bike that I wanted but didn't think I would get. There's a thrill to a surprise. One of the best Christmas surprises that we've ever gotten was uh, this, this past Christmas, our daughter surprised us and let us know that we were getting to be grandparents for Christmas. Yeah, so... The gift hasn't been delivered yet, um, but uh, we, we have, uh, hopefully in September, something to unwrap that's coming soon, and we're excited about that. So many things we remember about Christmas are the surprises that come our way, and that was so true about Joseph, Jesus' earthly father figure, that first Christmas. We really don't know a lot about Joseph. We've got a few details that we can kind of surmise In fact, even the the research that I did, I was almost disappointed that more commentaries, more study Bibles, don't really give us more details about the individual's life who was so important in the development, in the growth of Jesus. We know that he was engaged to Mary, who was chosen to be Jesus' mother. We, We surmise that he was a carpenter from the things that we read. We know that he was a descendant of David, so he came from this kind of royal family. And yet, his entire story especially when you read through the Gospel of Matthew, everything we know about his person and about his character, we find out by the way that he responds to the surprises that come in his life. Like everything we see about Joseph, we know because something came his way that he didn't expect. Like so I kind of read through the Gospel of Matthew again, had Luke in the back of my mind as I read it, and I counted no less than 10 surprises that come his way in this kind of short period of a little over two, maybe three years that we see kind of a spotlight on Joseph's life. Like you, you've got a dude who has worked hard to build a business in Nazareth. He's worked hard to have a name for himself. Most likely he was a person of some influence and some respect, at least within his kind of smaller town and religious community. And then all of a sudden, his fiance comes to him and says, I'm pregnant. And he's doing the math on this one. Surprise. 
And then she says, it's from God. (laughs) Surprise. And then the angel shows up and says, you're supposed to marry Mary. You're gonna be an instant dad. And by the way, he's the Messiah. There's five surprises so far, pretty big ones. Then you're gonna have a census that's gonna take you to Bethlehem. You'll get a surprise visit from some shepherds. You're gonna get a surprise visit maybe as much as two years later while you're still in Bethlehem from these wise men. Then once they leave, you're gonna be surprised that somebody's gonna try to kill your adopted son. Then you surprise, you've gotta go to Egypt and then surprise, after about a year, you can come back. But surprise, don't go there. Surprise, you gotta go to, this guy's got one surprise after another. And everything we see and know about his life is how he deals with those things. There are some good surprises, aren't there? Like, I, I, anybody like a surprise party? Many of you say no, but you, act, you say I don't like surprise parties, but you really do, isn't that true? Right, we like a surprise party. You like a raise that you didn't expect? I got a bill-looking thing in the mail this week. I was a little nervous as I was opening it up. And here it was a check because I'd overpaid. Surprise, don't you like those? Maybe you get a little gift from your spouse or a friend that you didn't expect, surprise. We we were out to eat and I don't know why, they brought us a complimentary dessert. At first I felt a little guilty and I was like, get thee behind me. And then I just went, surprise, right? (laughs) Take it. Some surprises are great, We, we love them. Not all surprises are that way. Some surprises we don't like when you find out about the health crisis or you experience a tragic loss that you didn't expect. When you just wanted to fill up your car with gas and you looked at the tank or the pump. (laughs) Surprise. When inflation's at a 40 year high or you got family members making decisions that you do not agree with. That person you thought you could count on let you down And maybe the bill-looking thing you got in the mail was actually a bill you didn't expect. Or a home repair you weren't planning on this soon, but now you have no choice. And the list of good surprises are awesome. The list of not-so-good surprises, I could go on and on, couldn't I? And there's no surprise that these surprises keep coming and there are too many to mention. It's interesting when we talk about these things, one of the things I think that we learn is how someone responds to surprises in life tells you a lot about who they really are. Does it not? (laughs) When you watch how someone responds to the unexpected, the things they didn't plan, the things they didn't didn't want, when those things come their way, when you watch how they respond, it tells you a lot about people, which means that if our guy Joseph in this story just gets dealt one surprise after another, then if we watch his life in this story, we're gonna learn a lot about his character it's also gonna help us to know how we can deal with the surprises that come our way. So I wanna show you five things from the life of Joseph today that help us know what to do when life surprises you. Because odds are, for some of you, you're in the middle of some kind of surprise that life has thrown your way today. And if not, don't you know they're gonna come eventually? So if that's the case, let's talk about what to do when life surprises you. Five things we see from the life of Joseph in this Christmas story. We're gonna look at his life just a little bit. Here's the first one, number one. What do you do when life surprises you? You give space for grace. Number one, you give space for grace. Because what's our normal response when a surprise comes our way? Maybe frustration or even anger. Maybe even a little bit of resentment bitterness. You, you, might, you might have a little jealousy sometimes with surprises. Maybe even revenge comes in your mind. You, you might even think, if you're thinking in a spiritual context sometimes when you don't like something that you see, <clears throat> that your response actually kind of becomes kind of legalistic. And the reality is that oftentimes our initial response to some kind of a surprise can often be tied directly back to feelings and emotions that we have because it's connected to some individual on the other side of that surprise. Isn't that true? Like that's the case with Joseph. Watch this, Matthew chapter one, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary, Jesus' mother Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. Now look, if this is what's happening in that day and time, this pledge to be married goes beyond just a simple engagement. 
In many ways, they were already considered to be husband and wife, even though they hadn't formally entered in physically or uh, kind of geographically into everything we would think about as marriage. This was a legally binding deal. He is pledged, she is pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now just think about that for a moment. Because if, if, if you're Joseph and Mary comes and tells you this and you know the interaction that you've had with each other and you know there's no way that that pregnancy could be something that you're a part of, what emotions do you have? I mean, immediately, you've gotta think of this guy. He's thinking of his family. He's thinking of his reputation. Not only that, he's gotta be heartbroken. He's been betrayed in the worst possible way Verse 19, but because Joseph was her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. You can consider this situation and all the ways in which his heart is broken and the emotional responses he could have, and yet what he chooses to do here is offer grace. Instead of making a big deal out of it, instead of causing a, a, a ruckus, instead of going in with fanfare and trying to get even or revenge or respond with jealousy, instead, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace and had in mind to divorce her quietly. He chooses this. And what he does is he gives Mary, out of the, the, the heart of love that he has for her, compassion over judgment and over vengeance. And what's really helpful to consider if you're in a moment where a surprise comes your way to live in a way where compassion is the best default. If you're gonna have some kind of default response whenever some surprise knocks on your door, if you're gonna respond in a way when the unexpected comes your way, the best thing you can do is say, I'm gonna respond with compassion. That compassion is the best default. One of the things that, that's good for us to understand is in that culture, if, if Joseph is the husband, marries his fiance, and she is unfaithful, what was not just an option, but literally required, it was mandatory in that day and time that they go through a divorce. Like that was what was required by the law. And Joseph had two options. Option number one, submit her to public scrutiny, which would most likely end in her being stoned as the Jewish response kind of from the law to the sin that she would have had been thought to have committed. Or his other option was this, instead of her execution, he could choose to show grace, probably pull in a smaller group of people so there were some witnesses. They would go through some paperwork, if you will, so that that engagement could be ended. She could go off quietly because he didn't want her to suffer disgrace and he could kind of move on from that. Joseph had two options. And do you see how he chose grace there? Do you see how he chose compassion? And this is even before he knows what's going on. So this tells us an awful lot about his character, does it not? And I'm so thankful for grace. So many times it can be easy for us to assume the worst of other people, to just begin to think that, that there's a negative side to these things without ever putting yourself in their position, to put yourself in their shoes. And compassion calls us, even in the moments when we have surprises, to think beyond ourselves and show a little grace. You ever been showed grace? I had a boss that helps me to learn from my mistakes, parents who supported me. I can tell you the greatest expression of grace that I've ever been given in my life outside of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross has come to me from my wife, Rhonda. And I've given her plenty of opportunities to show grace. In fact, the reality is, for those of you that are married, probably the, the greatest opportunities you will have to show grace and compassion will be from your spouse. Because nobody will surprise you more than your spouse, true? Because they are the person that you, are st that you spend the most time with, right? <laughs> and as a result, there's gonna be lots of surprises. But here's the deal. It's an opportunity to let God work through your life and to show grace, because I can tell you, when you show that grace, I'm sure you deserve it as well. The, those surprises that you have brought you're never gonna have more opportunity than to do it in those moments. R really, this idea of grace and compassion is, is all behind why we're working through Serve Week in these next um, few days, because it gives us an opportunity to go out and show in a tangible way the love of Jesus to a world that doesn't always see it. The reality is, 
for many in our culture today, they do not connect the word church with love. Isn't that true? (laughs) And that doesn't match up to the church that I know. So it allows us the opportunity to go out and show the love of Jesus, to give God's grace to other people. I've got a friend that years ago, I heard him say this and it just, it just stuck. He, he was talking about how in his church, they were gonna go out and they were gonna go into the community and they were going to do things that would show people the love of Jesus with the intention that when people saw the love of Jesus, it would cause them to want to know more about Jesus himself. And here's how he says it. If you make beautiful music, people will listen to the lyrics. Isn't that true? Make beautiful music and people will listen to the lyrics. I was in the store the other day, heard a song that I hadn't heard in a while, and then the chorus gets stuck in your head. That's catchy, that's good. So I went back and listened to the song, and as I listened to the song, I didn't just listen to the chorus that gets stuck in your heads, I listened to the verses, and they're nasty. Like I was like, I did not know that that's what this song was about. I'd take a shower right away. It's like, I, I, I can't ever listen to that again. But do you know why it got stuck in my head? Because it was catchy. And that music caused me to want to listen to the lyrics. Well, the same thing's true about how you live your life. In your home, (laughs) in the workplace, in what we do in the community. And if you make beautiful music, people will want to listen to the lyrics. But it means we're going to show grace And not just for one week in July. Serve week isn't this one week so that from here on out you can go, good, I don't have to do anything else for 51 more weeks. Praise God. (laughs) No, I hope that on a regular basis, somewhere you're involved through Calvary, somewhere else in serving and reaching out to the community. It's not a one-time thing. It's just another tangible way for us to show grace. Uh, Let let me talk about making space for grace kind of in a different way too. Because there's a, there's a good chance before this week is over, some kind of surprise is gonna come knocking on your door. And when it does, choose to respond before you react. Choose to respond before you react. What's the difference, Chad? Well, a reaction is usually something that's just a reflex, right? It just kind of comes out without you thinking. It's just kind of what, what just kind of, you get squeezed and it's what kind of just flows out of you kind of thing. And oftentimes, a reaction to something is not a good thing, true? (laughs) So if we know surprises are going to come our way, when those surprises come, we do well to choose to respond before we react. A reaction is reflexive. It's almost like what we do out of panic. A response is more deliberate. It's where I kind of pause process what I want to do here, who I want to be here, how do I want to handle this surprise, and then I respond as a result of that. And it's not always easy. I think it's something that we have to learn and entrust to the Lord and have him help us. But the last time you were surprised, which did you do? Did you react? Or did you deliberately take time and say, how's the best way that I can respond? I got a friend that's really good at this. I had a I don't know, do you ever get something that you just feel like you wanna complain about, anybody else? Like I had one of those things, and it wasn't about him, but I knew that he would listen, and I also knew he could do something about it. So I called him up, and I said, man, can I just talk to you about this? Sure, let's talk. So I just kinda unloaded. And then it was quiet on the other end. I was waiting for him to just kinda chime in. Because what's the Bible say? Misery loves company? Does the Bible say that? No, the Bible, you know what I mean, right? The Bible doesn't say that. So I started getting, blah, 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 blah. He's just listening. So I thought, I'm gonna give it to him one more time. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I just kind of gave it all to him. And finally, he goes, is there anything else you want me to know? And I was like, well, that's no fun. And I said, no, I, th- I think that's it. He says, great, now, now let me respond to what you just said. And then he gave me like the most balanced and wise and, and kind of answer. And I was like, I, I, I did not call him for grace. But I got a lesson in how powerful it is. And ever since then, I thought, man, I, I don't want to just react to the things that come my way. I want to respond in a way that allows God to work through my life and show grace to others. James says this, James chapter one, verse 19, says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Now, I don't know if this is biblical, but I had a friend say to me just recently, he said, the reason God gave us two ears and one mouth is because he wants us to be quick to listen and slow to speak. That's kind of good theology, isn't it? (laughs) Slow to become angry 
Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now look, choosing grace does not mean ignoring truth. And you see this even in Joseph's life. This is well before he knows what's really going on here. But out of his character, out of the walk that he had with the Lord, out of who he had developed to be, he chose grace first. When you have a surprise come knocking on your door, I hope your first step, your default mode, will be to make space for grace in that situation, which takes us to the second thing, number two, that you pre-decide to be faithful. Number two, that you pre-decide to be faithful. What does that mean, Chad? That before you even get to the surprise, you've already decided how you're gonna handle it when that surprise comes your way. We've gotta think about this from the life of Joseph. Matthew chapter one, verse 19. It says, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. He had already chosen to live a life, and you're gonna see this through the obedience that he shows over and over again. He had already decided that when moments came where he had to make a choice about how he was gonna respond to something, he would respond in a way that was faithful to what God wanted. Here's how the ESV version says that same passage of scripture. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Out of what was already in him, he had chosen how to respond because he had already pre-decided that he was gonna be faithful. If you're familiar with sports at all, no matter what the athletic competition is, you know that the athletes practice and they have a game plan and they go through scenarios of what might happen because they don't wanna be surprised when they get out on the field. They already wanna know when that happens, here's how we believe we're gonna respond. They've pre-decided how they're going to move forward towards victory. And the same thing's true in our lives. At some point, we have to pre-decide how we're gonna handle those surprises that come our way. Here's the reason why. Consistent you is building crisis you. Who you are consistently is determining who you're going to be when you face a crisis. Is a crisis gonna come your way, yes or no? (laughs) Yes, it is. And when that crisis hits, you're gonna find out what's really inside of you. That's crisis you. But the way that crisis you is developed is through what you do day by day. That's why sports teams practice because they're developing muscles consistently day by day that they're then ready to use when the crisis hits. Does this make sense? So look, you are building right now today through the consistency, through the day by day, through the decisions you make, you are pre-deciding who you will become in those moments when conflict or the unexpected or difficulties or surprises come your way because consistent you is building crisis you. And look, those crises are gonna come. There was, there's, a, there's a little town outside of Mexico City. It's actually a kind of a tourist spot that people will go to. Their river has kind of been nasty and polluted and they're trying to clean it up, make it more of an attraction. So they just built this really cool kind of river walk with this bridge that kind of goes along the river and they wanted to celebrate the inauguration of it. So you've got the mayor and they have this ceremony and it was this kind of suspension bridge that was wood and metal. It's really kind of a, a pretty spot. And then they have all the ceremony and then the mayor starts leading everybody on a walk over the bridge. Council members, city officials, all kinds of people. And as they get to a certain point in the bridge, all of a sudden, and if you search online, you can see this, the the, the bridge just separates underneath like where the mayor is and all these people go crashing 10 feet down into a ditch. Now everybody was okay, a few broken bones here and there and I know the the mayor's wife got landed on and she wasn't very happy. (laughs) But the reality is, here's what the mayor said, and think about this in light of your life. He said, the presence of officials and journalists probably exceeded the bridge's capacity to hold what it was suspending. Look, and the same thing's gonna come. Every every surprise that comes your way puts a little more weight on the, the bridge of your life, and you're holding more and more, and crisis you needs to be built so it can hold the surprises that come your way. Is this making sense? So you have to be deliberate to build consistent you so you're ready for crisis you. You gotta pre-decide. How do you do that, Chad? Well, let me give you a couple of thoughts not to do. The first, pre-decide not to be fearful (laughs) because these things are gonna come your way and you will be caught off guard, but is God with you? So if God's with you in those moments, then you pre-decide, I'm not gonna be fearful in these moments and in these times, because his word is true, and even though I'm surprised, he's not. 
So I'm gonna choose not to let fear get the best of me. Let me, let me give you another one, and, and let me know if you, if you know what I mean by this. Predecide not to be flaky. What's that mean? Do you know people that are wishy-washy? People that just can't say, I might do this, I might do that, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And they're not really committed in their faith. Look, in those moments, pre-decide not to be flaky. Pre-decide, God, when, when surprises come, I'm gonna keep my trust in you. James says it this way, James 1, 8, such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. See, some people wait till the surprise of the crisis comes, and then they say to themselves, well, I could do it God's way, or maybe I could do it this way. And they see which one is better, and they're just a, they're just a flake, and they're unstable in that moment. So you gotta predecide not to be fruitful, not, not to be flaky. Let me give you another one. Predecide not to be phony when surprises come your way. Because sometimes what we do is we act one way in front of other people, or we act one way in public, or, or people in other services act one way in church, and then act a different way at home. And the only word you can really come up with is phony. And there's a lot of people who have a, a phonyometer. Do you know what that is? That's a meter inside that measures phoniness. And the reality is, you know who has the strongest ones? Parents, grandparents? It's your kids. And the levels you're hitting on the phoniometer inside of them is telling them how much they can actually believe God for themselves. And you have to pre-decide that no matter how this surprise comes, God, I put my trust in you. You pre-decide to be faithful. So you might not know for sure, but some of you are already facing a surprise. It's, it's not a surprise anymore, it's your reality. How are you gonna handle this? How are you gonna navigate it? And some of you don't know what's coming yet, but you do know this. You do know who might push your buttons this week. Can I get an amen? <laughs> or you might know what temptation might come knocking on your door. Or you might know the things that you need to live out and model for your family. So pre-decide that with integrity, even if it's difficult, God, I'm gonna be faithful even in the middle of this surprise, which takes us then, because you, you say, Chad, well, that's easier said than done. Absolutely, which takes us to the third thing, number three, face the unknown with courage. Because so many times when a surprise comes, a surprise comes with the unknown. Put yourself back in the shoes of Joseph, carpenter from Nazareth. Many theologians speculate that Nazareth was probably only about 500 people. This is a tiny little town. I just went back and visited my hometown Tiny little town, no, no stoplights. This kind of little market that's there in the center in little Southington that's outside of Warren. And so when I think of Nazareth, I kind of think of a little place like that. So you've got Joseph and then all of a sudden this happens to him. Matthew chapter two, verse 13. It says, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Who's they? This is when the wise men had left. They'd been there for a visit, brought some gifts. When the wise men had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Hey, get up, he said. This, this implies that he's already in bed for the night. Have you ever already been in bed for the night and somebody tells you to get up? How many of you enjoy that? No. So poor Joe, <laughs> get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. And stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. Now for us, we just kind of picture a couple people walking away from the nativity set, right? Isn't that what we picture? <laughs> There's a whole lot more than that. So they're running by night for their lives, probably about 100 miles from Bethlehem to the border with Egypt. And then if they actually went to kind of the, the main city, Alexandria, where there was actually a Jewish population there, because you gotta imagine, they're not going to another state in the same country, they're going to another country. They're Jewish people going where there's Egyptians. Different language, different culture, probably not even welcome. They're refugees. And they're going to Alexandria and to this place, many speculate, where they can go and where they can kind of hide out for a while. But Joseph does not know what he's doing. And God can give us courage when we face the unknown. I've seen a lot of people live life with courage here at Calvary when that health diagnosis comes that they didn't expect. And when they go through that tragic loss and when they don't know what they're gonna do for a job now or they're not sure how to navigate that family hurt 
And over and over and over again, I have just been so amazed by people who said, God, I don't understand this. God, I don't get it. God, I don't know how this is gonna end, but I trust you, so will you give me courage? What did God say to Joshua in Joshua 1.9 when they were going into the promised land? He says, you be strong and courageous, for I'm not gonna leave you or forsake you. Why do we often need courage? We usually need courage either because we're not sure we have what it takes or we're not sure that this is gonna end well, (laughs) right? I don't know that I can do this. I don't know that we're gonna make it. And those are the times when we need courage. And can you imagine Joseph? He's a carpenter from Nazareth. And now he's gotta run by night for his life with his child that's not even his, but happens to be the Messiah. He's got a lot on him. And yet, watch this. This is what we learned from Joseph. You can have courage knowing that God will provide. When you're in those moments and you say to yourself, I'm not sure I have what it takes. Courage comes because you know that God will provide. Isn't that interesting? The scripture we just read said that Joseph had that little wake-up call in the dream after the wise men had left. Well, do you remember the wise men when they came, they left gifts? Does anybody remember the gifts that they left? Do you remember that? It was gold, Frankenstein, and myrrh. You remember this, right? And the wise men leave this. These weren't the typical gifts you'd take to a birthday party. This wasn't like Legos and a gift card. These were gifts that were fit for a king. These were the kind of gifts that if you were a wise steward, you could use them to kind of bankroll a trip maybe to Egypt and to pay for an Airbnb for about a year. So before it was even necessary for them to run, God had already provided what they needed. And courage comes because you know that God will provide in those moments when surprises come your way. We, we, th- this year, actually, it'll be 10 years since we moved into this building. And I remember we, we purchased the building at the end of 2010, and it was kind of mid-2011, where we were having to make the really hard decisions about, now what route will we go in renovating and moving and all those different things? And there were so many unknowns and uncertainties and so many things that were really um, opportunities to lose more than win. And I remember we were having a board meeting one night, it was, it was, we met here in the building. It was right out in the atrium. It was before the fireplace was a fireplace. It was still a concession stand. Does anybody remember that? And we still had the casino carpeting in here, in the atrium. And I remember we were trying to decide what to do. And I remember one of the board guys just saying in that meeting, you know, guys, I think we just need to move forward in this direction and believe that God will provide. The very next day, a gentleman who's now with Jesus called up and said, can I stop by the church office? And I know I've told before how he walked into our business administrator's office and said, I know that this is an exciting season for the church. This was his exact quote. And I know you haven't done the fundraising deal yet, but I bet it would be good for our pastors and the board to know that God is behind what's happening here. And I just feel led, and he slid a check for $75,000 across the desk. And before, before we'd even taken the step of faith, God had already started to provide what we would need. And the reality is you can move forward with courage and believe that God will provide. And you can have courage knowing that God will protect. God's gonna help you each step along the way. Just like he did for Joseph. Now look, we call it protection. Sometimes it was craziness. Sometimes it was running for your life. Sometimes it was the unexpected. Sometimes it was not what you hoped for. But every step along the way, God was there with them as they trusted in him. And I know it's not for all of you today, but some of you just need courage because you don't see how this is gonna end well or you don't know if you have what it takes And God is speaking to you about your job, about your health, about your family, about your faith. And he's saying to you, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and courageous because I'm never gonna leave you and I'm never gonna forsake you. And I have victory on the other side of this for you. Which takes us then to the fourth thing. And I think something super important. Number four, when you have surprises, you listen for the leading of the Holy Spirit. Number four, you listen for the leading of the Holy Spirit. 
In the New Testament, the only author who really talks about dreams in the way we read here in these stories is Matthew. And four of those dreams come to Joseph. Four times God communicates clearly with Joseph through a dream. I had a dream the other day that was just goofy. Do you ever have one of those? I tried to explain it to Rhonda and she just kind of looked at me and shook her head like, what have I married kind of thing, right? But I've had a few dreams in my life that I know very clearly were dreams that came to me from the Lord, either to communicate something or confirm something in my life. Not every day. And although Joseph had these dreams that came his way, I do believe the Holy Spirit speaks to us every day. True? Because we have some things that Joseph didn't. God may speak through dreams. God may also speak through circumstances to us like he did to Joseph. But we have God's word right here in front of us in a way that generations of people never had. And God will speak to you on a daily basis through his word. Do you believe that? Like he can guide you and direct you as you listen for the Holy Spirit. And then I also think you have to remember that Joseph did not have the same relationship with the Holy Spirit that you and I have because of what God did when he poured out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two. So we have a Holy Spirit who is right here beside us He is our advocate, and he walks through with us in every moment of our lives. So look, if you're in a time where you hit a surprise, so many times the reason a surprise is a surprise is because we didn't expect it, and the problem with it is we don't know what to do. When the check comes that you didn't expect, that's a good surprise, because you go, oh, I know what to do. (laughs) Spend it. But when the bill comes, and you don't know where that money's gonna come from, or the news comes that you didn't expect, in those surprises, the problem is we don't know what to do. But God has promised he will help us in those moments, so we have to listen for the leading of the Holy Spirit. How do I do that, Chad? Let me give you a couple of thoughts. One, you've gotta tune out distractions, because there will be voices, and there will be thoughts in your own mind, and there will be things that other people say, and there will be all the noise of the world around us, that will distract us from the moments when in that surprise, we need to say, Holy Spirit, will you help me with this? Will you guide me with this? We tune out distractions. I also think you have to tune out conflicting messages. Let's take that one more step. There may be things in our media diet. There may be things in our past practices. There there may be things in our own minds. Sometimes it's even sin that causes us to let other thoughts, if you will, voices, if you will, come into our minds, and we need to tune those out so that we can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because if you're putting things in that block God's ability to communicate with you, how do you expect to hear from him? Does that make sense? We, we, had, a, we had a garage sale once. You ever had one of those? We had a garage sale, and um, I don't, oh man, I hate to brag but I was the CFO of the garage sale, (laughs) chief financial officer. Yeah, that's a pretty big deal. I worked the cash box, and uh, so I was sitting there, and I watched this guy, and you know, you just tell different people, he's just kind of shopping and didn't appreciate our junk, and uh, he walked over to one of those, um, you know those like CD players that had a radio and stuff in it, like a boom box kind of thing, you know what I'm talking about? It had the handle on it, all that stuff. And he's looking at this thing and he comes over and he starts asking me all these different questions about it, you know, and uh, how does it work and all this kind of thing, does it light up and all this kind of stuff and how do you tune in radio stations? He's asking me all this stuff. And I finally just said to him, well, do you you want to plug it in? you want to check it out? It's a garage sale, remember this, right? You know, and so he's like, yeah, we'll check it out. So we walked over to an outlet and and plugged it in and we're looking at it and he he, he just kept on with the questions. Like we had to tune in a radio station and he wanted to see how the CD player worked and he's asking all these questions. He's going on and on and on and just being kind of real critical and finally, like, and I'm a a Christian, amen, anybody else, right? So, so, but I hadn't prayed that morning and so we're standing there and, and he finally says to me, he goes, I really don't like the, I really don't like the sound of this. He says, can you adjust like the treble and the bass? And I'm like kind of looking at it and I finally just looked at him and I said, sir, I, I, don't, I don't know that that comes with the $2 model. <laughs> and I am now formally repenting of <laughs> how I handled that surprise, right? Can I tell you this? You do not have a $2 Holy Spirit. 
right? And so many times I think we minimize the fact that if you're in the midst of a surprise, tune into the Holy Spirit and hear what he has to say. That comes from spending time in God's word. That comes from inviting him. I, I would say if you're in the middle of a surprise, make it, and maybe even with your own mouth, speak it out loud and say, Holy Spirit, I'm listening. And can I tell you this? That's more for your benefit than it is his. Because I know he's communicating. The challenge is that I've got to tune in and listen. And I've got to hear what he says. And so many times what happens is in the surprise moments, in the stressful moments, those are the times where we tend to push aside the time that it sometimes takes to tune in. Times of greater stress call for times of greater seeking. Because when there's more noise around you, that's when it requires more deliberate energy, more deliberate intentionality to say, Holy Spirit, I'm listening. I went to lunch with a friend once, and we were eating in a restaurant that was pretty, pretty noisy. And so we're sitting there, and my friend is real soft-spoken. So we're having this conversation, and it was getting pretty intense, but the problem was, it seemed like the more intense the conversation got, the louder the restaurant got and the quieter he got. And so I'm trying to tune into what he's saying, and I'm listening, and I'm listening, and I'm listening, and eventually I realized I'm hovering over his lunch. <laughs> like just breathing on his quesadilla, right? Because I didn't want to miss what he was saying. And unless I tuned into that, with all the noise that was around, I wasn't going to hear what he was trying to communicate to me. And so many times we, we, we either tune out or we give up when we're having a hard time hearing. And in those times, friends, that's when you lean in. That's when you seek more. That's when you, you, you listen in a new way and say, Holy Spirit, in the moment of this surprise, I need you now more than ever. Surprises are gonna come your way. When they do, give space to grace and today, before the surprise comes, you, you pre-decide to be faithful. Believe that God will give you courage when you face the unexpected. You tune in and listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And let me give you one more. This is kind of more of an encouragement. Number five, remember that surprises often lead to salvation. Remember that surprises often lead to salvation. Joseph, the well-respected carpenter from Nazareth, never signed up for the story in chapters one and two of Matthew. True? <laughs> it's not what he expected. But aren't you glad he did? Because if he hadn't, we might not be here. He was a critical character in the story of Jesus bringing salvation, not just to the Jews, but to humanity. Now know this, none of these surprises caught God by surprise, right? Look at this, Matthew chapter one, verse 22. All this, this is, this is the, the story that came to Joseph about Jesus being born. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. God saw this surprise hundreds of years before, not just in 122. Look at, look at 215. When they were in Egypt, they stayed there until the death of Herod, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. That had been promised, the, the, the escape to Egypt. Even after that, Matthew 223, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. Over and over again, there was a fulfillment. Know this, God is not surprised by your surprise surprises. And when they come your way, it's not that he didn't see them. He knew they were coming. And God is not surprised by your surprises. In many ways, your life is like a movie, right? He's the alpha and the omega. So he saw the beginning and he's already seen the end. But you're stuck in this scene right here, right now. And when you're living that scene of the movie, that's all you know. And so you're going, ooh, ah, ooh, ooh. And you don't recognize the happy ending that's coming. You ever watched a movie like that? Where you're a mess all through it and then it gets resolved at the end? And God's watching the whole story. He kind of sees it all. And he sees where Joseph is, but he knows the end. And Joe's going, ooh, ah, ooh. And God goes, Joseph, wait till you see what I'm gonna do here. See, God is not surprised by your surprises and know this, God is working out something beautiful from your unexpected. God is working out something beautiful from your unexpected. Now, this is just speculation on Chad's part. But I have to wonder if 
if maybe part of why Joseph was chosen to be the earthly father of Jesus was because he had developed a skill to be able to see things that other people could not see. He was a carpenter. And so when we think of carpenter, we, we so often think of someone working with you know, two by fours and hammer and nails. But a carpenter in that day and time, he not only would have worked with wood, he, he probably could have you know, built table and chairs, those, those things that we see kind of the skill passed on to Jesus. But uh, many times a carpenter was the same word that was used for a stonemason. So he would take stone and use it to build buildings and homes. And, and he, he, was a, he was a craftsman. So how many times would Joseph look at something and say, you don't look like much right now, but I see what you can become. I see what can be made out of this once it's in the master's hands. And I wonder how many nights from Nazareth to Bethlehem and Bethlehem to Egypt and Egypt to Israel and then Israel back to Galilee that Joseph maybe stepped outside at night once Mary was in bed and Jesus was asleep for the night. And he just said, God, what are you doing? God, I don't know if I can do this. And God, I didn't sign up for this. And I didn't see this coming. And yet he knew that he could look and see that somehow, through all of this, God was taking those surprises. We tend to think as we look at scripture that Joseph probably never lived to see Jesus become man. He probably never heard him preach. And yet he could look and say, God, I know that through all of this, you're making something beautiful. And so I put my trust in you. So can I ask you just to bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? And whether you're in this room or you're watching this on a screen somewhere, there's two things that God wants to do with this message today, I believe. For some of you, there's a surprise that's coming your way. And today's the day where God is giving you a little bit of a heads up so that you'll be more prepared and ready to trust him when it comes. But for many of us, today's a day where we're living in the middle of a surprise. And we would say, God, I need your help today. God, I don't see how this movie ends. And I'm not sure what any of this means for me or for my family. But today's a day where like Joseph, you've gotta say, God, I trust you. And I put this unexpected, I, I put this surprise in your hands. And in just a moment, the team's gonna lead us in a, probably a good song for a carpenter that says, I will build my life upon your love. And we're gonna stand, and if you're watching this somewhere, I would encourage you, if God's speaking to your heart, to respond in some way, to stand where you are, to, to raise a hand, to somehow physically interact. If you're in auditorium one, or if you're in auditorium two, I'm gonna invite you to step out of your seat and walk to the front of the room. And if you're walking through a season of surprise right now and you would say God I need to entrust this to you I need an infusion of courage God I need your help to have grace then I would encourage you not just to stand there or not just to sing but to take a physical step to say God I put this in your hands there's nothing magical about coming to an altar but I truly believe this that oftentimes for us to have a, a spiritual encounter it requires a physical response but as you take that step to just simply say, God, I put this in your hands, it's a step towards God making something beautiful out of the surprises in your life. So can I ask you to stand with me, if you would, please? And Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for the way you speak to us. God, we thank you for the way you encourage us. And Lord, as we sing this song, God, we ask that you would fill us with your spirit and with courage as we put our trust in you, in Jesus' name, amen. As we sing this song, if you need to entrust something into God's hands today, would you step out of your seat, come and join us here, and we'll pray together in just a moment. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life 
gonna take a moment and, and pray, but can we, can we do this first? For, for some of us, this needs to be a moment where we, we pre-decide that we're gonna be faithful. And that might be a couple that's sitting on a couch at home, or you might have to take the hand of the person next to you or put a hand on the shoulder of the person next to you or some way just to say, in the midst of this surprise, we're holding on to Jesus. And then I just wanna give a minute to tune in to the Holy Spirit because what the Holy Spirit can do in a fraction of time is so powerful. So if you need wisdom or if you need guidance right now, let's just pause for a minute and would you ask him? Holy Spirit, your word says that you are our comforter, and our counselor, you're our friend, you are our helper, you are our advocate, you're right there beside us. And Father, right now you are, you're reminding someone that the surprise that they're in, you're right there beside them, and that you never leave or forsake us. Lord, there are relationships represented in this room today that more than anything else, they need compassion and grace. So God, would you help us to be agents of that grace? And Lord, I pray for the one that needs courage today because of what they're gonna step into tomorrow because the conversation they have to have won't happen without courage because the changes that, that they need to make in their lives won't happen without courage. Lord, would you give them courage to follow you? And Lord, would you remind us today, especially the one who this last week has just seemed to be a big surprise. Would you remind us that this was no surprise to you and that Jesus, as we entrust this to you, because every one of Joseph's surprises led to you, Jesus. So Jesus, as we entrust our lives to you, would you make something beautiful out of these unexpected things in our lives? God, thanks for your word. Thanks for your presence here today. I pray for those standing at this altar, God, that these moments would not have been just a a moment of, of, of some kind of spiritual exercise, but instead, God, would you use this as a moment to be a hinge moment in their lives, a moment that they'll come back to and remember that your presence was, was right here, that, that when they step into their week, God, they're gonna see your faithfulness. Lord, as we go from here, would you send us out with your special favor and with your wonderful peace? And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, if you get a moment to encourage one another to speak a word of life to someone, those of you that are standing here at this altar, don't step away without knowing that God is walking through this with you. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for being here.